in the quest for a fairy tale ending, millions dream of finding true love and living happily ever after. But what if this dream transforms into a chilling horror story? Enter Jane Andrews, once the dresser of a duchess, now entangled in a tale of cold-blooded murder. Born in 1967 in Lincolnshire, Jane Andrews was the youngest of three children in a less than fortunate family. Financial struggles loomed over her parents, a carpenter and a social worker, forcing them to sell their home when Jane was just moving to Grimsby, the family's debt only grew. Despite academic promise, Jane's focus wavered due to personal challenges. Her attractiveness and intelligence overshadowed the underlying issues. Tragedy struck when, in response to the revelation of her truancy, Jane attempted suicide by ingesting a dangerous mix of pills. Her parents, resolute in secrecy, chose not to seek help, allowing Jane to slip in and out of consciousness until her recovery. This desperate act marked the beginning of a downward spiral, casting a shadow over her academic pursuit. Regardless of her stress and mental problems, though, Andrews would go on to the Grimsby College of Art to study fashion design. In the book Evil Women by John Marlowe, it speaks of an abortion Andrews received during college. This book continues, stating that the abortion caused even more trauma, resulting in Andrews' mental health deteriorating further. When she graduated from college, Andrews struggled to find a job, but eventually found a position as a sales associate at Marks & Spencer's, a store specializing in clothing, home objects, and food. It was far from the life she wished she was living, but it was something bringing money in. Having a job didn't mean Andrews wasn't looking for other work, however. She would answer an anonymous advertisement from the magazine The Lady. The ad was searching for a personal dresser, making Andrews a perfect fit for the position after her years of fashion education. After submitting the inquiry, Andrews would not hear about this personal dresser position again for half a year. When she finally did receive correspondence back about the advertisement, Andrews was invited for an interview with the Duchess of York. Jane's vibrant attitude and outgoing nature allowed her to connect easily with the Duchess, and she passed her interview with flying colors. She began her career in July of 1988. Then, just like that, Jane Andrews was set to change her lifestyle from the near-poverty conditions she had always known to one of luxury. After 21 years, the new lifestyle she had found herself in allowed her to buy a car and even afford her own clothing. It wasn't uncommon for her to be around members of the royal family, and she was even referred to as Lady Jane. It was just under a year of employment under the Duchess when Andrews met a man who was 21 years her senior and worked as an IBM executive. The man's name was Christopher Dunn Butler, and their meeting would mark the beginning of a tumultuous relationship. The relationship between Dunn Butler and Andrews progressed quickly. The couple became engaged just three months after they met. They would marry in August of 1990, but it wasn't long before things began to sour. Despite the marriage she had to Dunn Butler, Andrews had already been having affairs. When she met Dimitri Horn, a shipping magnate from Greece, Andrews' feelings for Horn led her to leave Dunn Butler and move into a flat the Duchess rented for her. It wasn't long before Dunn Butler was filing for divorce, citing infidelity. And it was not only Jane who was going through relationship problems during these times. The marriage between Duchess Sarah, the Duchess who employed Jane, and Prince Andrew was also dissolving. Despite this, Andrews was kept on and given extra responsibilities, staying friends and confidants with the Duchess. Sadly, the relationship with Horn just wasn't meant to be. The relationship came to an end, with Horn being the one to call it quits. The breakup sent Andrews into a rage, and she would resort to trashing his flat, striking every mention of her name out of his journal, and writing herself a check from his brother's account. While for some, this may seem shocking and out of character for Andrews, it was sadly well-known behavior from her. There had been previous occasions of her violence towards ex-lovers, including giving death threats and vandalizing cars. She went as far at one point as to call an ex-lover to say that she was at an abortion clinic. She threatened to go through with the procedure if the lover did not come back to her. While this is abusive and toxic already, it becomes much worse when you realize Andrews wasn't even pregnant at the time. After her relationship with Horn failed, Andrews would attempt an overdose again, though she would never recover once again without intervention. The luxury life that Andrews was becoming accustomed to was suddenly cut short in November of 1997. She was dismissed from her career as the Duchess's dresser, learning this terrible news from someone who wasn't even the Duchess herself. The reason for the dismissal was claimed to be cost-cutting. 
This brought Andrew's finances under scrutiny. An inquiry into her finances revealed that despite making only $18,000 a year in her less than 10 years of employment, she had bought an expensive London flat and had $50,000 in savings. According to Independent, a palace official was quoted as saying they believed Andrews had stolen a large amount of money, though it was never proven legally. The dismissal from her position caused Jane to fall into a depression for some time before she would go on to get another job. The job that she found after her royal experiences was a position selling silver at Annabelle Jones. It was in August of 1998 that Jane Andrews would meet Tom Cressman through a mutual friend. The two hit it off incredibly well, and Cressman insisted on driving her home when he learned that she would be going on a trip to Greece. Despite what seemed to be a great start, the relationship would soon become rocky. Despite the passion that the two individuals had for one another, Andrews and Cressman wanted two different things out of life. While Andrews wanted to get married and start a family, Cressman was happy with his bachelor lifestyle. Their unhealthy relationship was filled with threats to one another. Andrews would threaten to expose Cressman's sexual interests, and it is reported Cressman would threaten to go to the tabloids with stories of Andrews' time with the Duchess. Despite this, Andrews would move into Cressman's flat after she broke her wrist. While it was meant to be temporary, Andrews had no plans on leaving during a trip to visit Cressman's family in September 2000. It is reported that Andrews asked a blunt question about marriage to Cressman and received just as direct of an answer. The straightforward answer told Andrews that Cressman had no intent on marrying her at all. On September 15th, Jane would ride to the airport with Cressman's mother and nephew, both of Cressman's relatives overhearing her mobile conversations, telling friends the relationship with Cressman was over. According to Andrews, on the flight back home, Cressman changed his mind about never marrying her. Not only did he change his mind, but Andrews reported Cressman said he would go to therapy for his more risk interests. However, the following day tells a different story. And Andrews' recount of the morning is that Cressman would physically restrain her, tying her up and sodomizing her non-consensually before ordering her out of his flat. A physical fight ensued and Cressman called for police intervention. Cressman would reach an operator and speak of his predicament. Despite being told help would be on its way, he was told the police are not a marriage guidance service, but are there to deal with and solve crimes. The help of police intervention never came, but phone records show that Jane was out of the flat by noon. Despite the morning events, Andrews would return to Cressman that evening, saying that the morning's events felt unreal. Before she returned, however, she sent his parents copies of inappropriate correspondence with another woman he had met in the United States. According to Andrews, the two attempted sexual contact again, after which Cressman fell asleep. Andrews said that she was unsure if she was sleeping or not when Cressman began to attack her, threatening her life as he did so. In what Andrews describes as self-defense, she manages to grab a cricket bat and a kitchen knife to defend herself. Though these items may seem uncommon for a bedroom scenario, Andrews states earlier that evening, before their sexual contact, she brought the two items upstairs in her attempt to defend herself. Andrews states that she hit Cressman with the cricket bat, and then as he pulled her hair, he fell onto the eight-inch blade of the kitchen knife. This unlikely story began to fall apart from the get-go. Despite claiming that this was an accident and stating she had no recollection of details, after the crime, there is evidence that Andrews did not immediately leave the crime scene. Prosecutors found evidence suggesting Andrews took a shower after her crime in the flat. She would even leave a note speaking of the alleged abuse she suffered from Cressman before finally leaving the flat an unknown amount of time after the murder. Andrews did not call the police. Instead, she called friends close to her, one of which being Duchess Sarah, who asked Andrews to turn herself in. It would be two days before Cressman's body was found in the flat and another two days before Andrews herself was found curled into the back seat of her vehicle. Andrews had another attempted overdose. It was less than a year later when Andrews was found guilty of the murder. This put on full display the jury's thoughts, who were given options to find her innocent if they believed she was protecting herself or guilty of manslaughter if they thought it was an accident. The former dresser of the Duchess of York was sentenced to prison for 15 years to life on the 16th of May 2001. Since her sentencing in 2001, 
Andrews has stayed relatively under the radar, but her record is certainly not spotless. She would escape prison briefly in 2009, remaining on the run for three days before being found again. In 2015, she was released unlicensed, but would return to prison shortly three years later in 2018 for harassment. Jane Andrews is officially out of prison at the time of this video. Living out a comparatively normal life, or as normal as one can considering her history, Documentaries continue to be produced about her life, highlighting the horrible actions she was capable of in the story of Jane Andrews. We learn how far people will go to protect their love, taking everything they can from a person to keep others from having the experience, even if they have to kill them. No one else will ever take them. Thank you for watching this video. Comment down below what you thought of this story. 